Good morning, Austin Ridge. How are you guys doing today? You good? Let's stand up together. My name's Shep Gibson. I'm glad to be leading worship with you today. Let's get ready to sing out our God's name. Above all else. an awesome God, high and above everything else. All right, come on, let's sing it out like we believe it. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord good to sing with you this morning. So good. I wanted to share a story with you um, about this next song. So this next song is called Yes, I Will. How many of you know this song? Yes, I Will. Oh, you're about to learn a good one. So this family at another church approached me and they said, would you come and sing?
for our daughter. I never met these people. I was like, what are you talking about? They said, our daughter, three years old, she's in the hospital. She has this rare condition. She can't breathe right now. She's got breathing tubes. She's fully sedated. And I'm like, wrecked for these parents. And so I'm like, yeah, I'll come worship with you guys in this hospital room, see, you know, help you get through it. So I go over there, and I wasn't sure what to bring. I brought a ukulele. I'm just playing ukulele worship songs in there. And I said, do you know the song, Yes, I Will? And they're like, yeah, we've sang it a few times. And we sang, Yes, I Will. And hearing these parents of this little girl in a hospital bed saying, Yes, I Will, lift you high in the lowest valley. And then, Yes, I Will, sing for joy when my heart is heavy. And sing that like they mean it was just insane. I look at my life and I'm like, things are pretty good a lot of the time. And I can sing that and just, yeah, for sure, in the lowest valley. But they were in the lowest valley. And I just wanted to encourage you this morning, wherever you are, whether you're in that lowest valley place, you can sing it out to God. You can lift that song of joy to God anyway for who he is. Because it's not about your circumstances. It's not about my circumstances. It's about the God who is above all circumstances. So as we sing this out, let's keep that in mind and know that we serve an awesome God.
Church, I want us to get excited about something. The last update I heard, that little girl was home with her family and she was recovering and she was doing well. So praise God coming through in that circumstance. Praise God from whom all blessings again raise your voice God, thank you for who you are. God, we praise you and lift you up. Your mighty name above all names. And God, in the hardest circumstances, when our hearts are heavy, just like the song says, we choose, we choose to praise and glorify the name that is above all names. God, you're worth it. You are worth it. Thank you that you meet here with us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Y'all may be seated. Good morning. My name is Don Ellsworth. I'm the missions pastor here at the Ridge. It is good to be with you today. Thank you for being with us. Whether you're here in the building or online, we want to welcome you. And if you are visiting with us for the first time, we want to just let you know that we would love to connect with you. Uh, if you're here, you have some cards in the seat back in front of you that we just ask you to fill out, or you can stop at one of the connections desks on the way out. We would just love to help you take that next step in your spiritual journey or here at the Ridge. Uh, before we go on, we just have a couple of quick things that we want to celebrate together. Many of you may or may not know that we have a young adult ministry here at the church called The Table. They meet on Tuesday nights, a uh, great community of young folks that are doing some great things and watching the Lord do some great things. Some exciting news is that over the last few months, five months or so, uh, they have seen their attendance on Tuesday night double, as well as uh, their community groups that meet throughout the city have also grown. Uh, they've had some incredible fun events, as you're seeing behind me, uh, some 80s theme nights, uh, luau, some other activities that they've had going on, and many more activities as they get ramped up for the summer. The most exciting thing is that we're seeing some young people come to Christ, choosing to follow Jesus and to give their lives to him, which is the ultimate goal. And so we are excited to be able to report that. We want you to know these things about how God is working in ways that you may not see directly, but we're just super excited about how God is at work through that team and through that ministry. Amen. We're excited to continue on in our series in Romans. Brad's going to be here in just a second. We want to encourage you to get your Bibles out, and uh, let's follow along as we just listen to God's Word being taught to us today as we follow His ways. Good to be with you this morning. Morning, church. How are we doing? It's good to be with you today. I want to say good morning to Dripping Springs Southwest Campus as well. If you have your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. It's a weekend that we remember uh, the heroes, the courageous men and women who have died for our freedom. And we are grateful for that freedom. 
Uh, today, I think it's ironic that this text is talking about freedom, maybe a little different kind of freedom, but freedom nonetheless. So when many of us became a Christian, you know, when you start dealing with sin in your life, it feels like when you're a new Christian, it's kind of these big, large sins, right? And I remember my mom used to, um, like, cook, and she'd get a little strainer in the, in the kitchen, in the, in the sink, and stuff would fall out the bottom. But it felt like when, when I first became a Christian, it wasn't these little things that came out, it was these big things, right? Like, my goal, I remember in college, I'd share Christ with people, they'd go, my goal this weekend is, and I'm thinking, what, be an evangelist? Not get drunk. Like, that would be the goal for the weekend. Like, I want to have one week where I don't get drunk. And I'm like, man, let's, let's pray about that goal together. I'd see him on Monday. How'd you do? Or, or, or maybe this, like, when you first became a Christian, it's like, I just want to not cuss as much. And this big, or, or I don't want to sleep with my girlfriend anymore, my boyfriend anymore. I want to be pure in these big, it, in some ways, it was easier to identify those things, right? Like, you automatically knew when you first became a Christian, well, that's what God wants me to work on first. I think, though, when I thought about my mom using that strain of these little things coming out, that feels like later in the Christian life. And, and when you, when you want to be more holy and you've been walking with God for a while, it's not necessarily always the big things that are easy to identify. It starts to become the attitudes, the thoughts, the intentions, the motivations. And sometimes I think those things are harder to deal with. Like, am I trying to manipulate this conversation to my advantage by not fully telling the truth? Am I trying to sway this person in a way that most benefits me? And you start to deal with these thoughts, the intentions, the attitudes of the heart, and to me those things become harder. Like loving someone that's not easy to love. And I used to think when I'd have a quiet time sometimes, I used to picture that strainer my mom would use, and like there's the word, I'm going to walk through the word every day, and sometimes I'd picture like God's word being this huge strainer. And I'm just going to kind of walk through it. And you walk through and you look back and you're like, oh, my gosh, look at the filth that God's word just took out of my life. What I want to talk about this morning is the doctrine of sanctification. How do you walk in a manner worthy of the calling? How do you become holy and conform to the image of Jesus? And really, chapter 6, 7, and 8 in Romans is about how to become more like Jesus. The first seven verses in chapter 6, remember, there were no commands given there, just, just facts, that it's not just enough only to believe in Jesus, but by believing in Jesus, you live in Jesus. Jesus lives through you. And we talked about what's true of the head is true of the body, that Jesus is freed from the penalty of sin. That was the death on the cross. And when Jesus rose from the grave, he was freed uh, from the presence of sin because he walked in newness of life. And our goal is that we would be, we know in Jesus, freed from the penalty of sin already. And one day we'll be freed from the presence of sin. That's called glorification in heaven. But today we're trying to walk through being freed from the power of sin. And like I said, sometimes we kind of limp back to church and maybe we had a bad week. Maybe we didn't fight well. Maybe we didn't struggle well, but we want to struggle well with sin. All sinners struggle with sin. They just don't realize it. And all Christians should realize there's a struggle with sin. I remember hearing the story one day about a guy walking down the street in Dallas Seminary and the president of the seminary was walking with him. And he was telling the president, I have found the power in Jesus where I can actually live without sinning. And the president of the seminary is like, well, that's interesting. And then all of a sudden this wind blew, his hat blew off, and he cursed. And the president said, what was that? He said, that was a mistake. <laughs> and see, what we do is we start to rename sin. We start to recategorize sin sometimes. And I don't believe it's possible to live without sin, but I do believe what Paul says is true. It's possible not to live under the mastery of sin. You don't swim in it. You don't live in it. You don't breathe it, that if you're walking with Jesus and he lives inside of you, that sin should bother you. And we talked about how when it stops bothering you, that's when the real problems come in this walk that we call sanctification. Verses 8 through 14 last week we looked at, and, and those are the commands to consider yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. The first command in, in Romans that, that we're not chickens, so we're not going to live like chickens, we're eagles, <laughs> 
and we should live better. We talked about this. The Christian life should be a superior way of living, that our life should look distinctly different. It doesn't mean we don't struggle with the same things. What it means is there's a power living inside of us that before Christ we did not have that option, the option not to be mastered by sin. So now we're going to get to the text today. I'm going to start in verse 15. We're going to finish the chapter today. Today I want to talk about the power. How do you have the power to say no to sin? And I'll start by saying this. If you're here today and you, you love Jesus, you walk with Jesus, you want to be more like Jesus, and yet you feel like there's this one thing in my life, there's these two areas in my life, I have tried and I've tried and I've tried and I just keep falling, I keep falling, I keep struggling. Does that mean I'm not a Christian? And I would say this, does it still bother you? <laughs> Yes, it bothers me. The Holy Spirit's still working. And it's got to be a struggle. So I'm going to try to give you um, some plans, some, some armor, some battle plans to fight against whatever that. We, we want to see today, guys, we want to see the chains come off. Because God is meant for you to live a free life. Jesus says, whoever sins is a slave to sin, meaning this, whoever knows Jesus is freed from the slavery of sin. I don't have to be the way I used to be. You follow me? You with me? I know it's a holiday weekend. You're probably thinking about stuff going on, but this is, I know I say this all, this is the greatest sermon text ever. <laughs> so we need to apply what this says. Verse 15, what then? Are we to sin because we are not under law, but under grace? Does that sound familiar to you, that question? Look back at verse 1. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Paul's still answering this argument. He has given you the theology of why you shouldn't keep sinning because you're under grace, you're not under law anymore. Now he's going to give you the power. Now he's going to tell you where to plug into as far as you don't have to live that way anymore. The fact that God loves us unconditionally, someone would ask, can we not do whatever we want and still go to heaven when we die? And it's been a question that's been asked generations in the church. It's, it would be like a husband, and I, I love vows in a wedding, right, for rich or for poor, in sickness and health, till death do us part. And I always look at them, and they end that by saying, I do or we do. And then you know about Tuesday they're going to break one of those vows, right? And what's interesting about those vows is it would be like a husband looking at a wife that maybe she came from a very abusive relationship, a relationship that just wrecked her. And, and God used you to help deliver her out of that relationship because she saw holiness. She saw what it looks like to walk with God. And you look at her because you know the struggles and you say, I want you to know that divorce is not a word in my vocabulary. It doesn't matter what happens, what you do, what you don't do. I'm not leaving. And the security and the love and the affection that should foster in her heart could you imagine them doing the vows, doing the wedding ceremony, going to the reception, and then the husband walks out, and she sees her wife over there flirting with the old guy? Do we not do that against our groom, Jesus Christ, during the weeks? That we've been delivered from this abusive life. What Paul is going to say is what benefit, what profit, what fruit did the past life, your last sin master give you? Why in the world would we ever want to go back? Like if someone says, well, if I'm a Christian and God will forgive me of all my sins and he already has, then I can do whatever I want. If you're asking that question, you're not understanding what salvation is. Why would I ever want to go back there? It's that question that students will often ask youth pastors, how far is too far? Is it okay if we keep one leg on the floor all the time, Right? And if you're asking the question, your heart's already in the wrong place. And so again, Paul says, some of you are going to ask this question, why we can just do whatever we want. Could you imagine that groom's grief? I've given you complete freedom. You've got all guarantees. Even when you're faithless, I'll remain faithful. And yet, the first moment you run and betray me again is your groom. There's a book in our Bible, it's called Hosea. That's what the book's about. Hosea is a picture of the Lord, and unfortunately, we're a picture of the bride in that story. And she keeps running away and running away to other lovers. And God says to Hosea, keep loving, keep pursuing. Aren't you glad that's what Jesus does? I mean, where would most of us be? Where would all of us or any of us be today if he wasn't this, as, as one writer says, the holy hound of heaven, the pursuer of people? 
Paul's answers in verse 16 to the question asked in verse 15, do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. I love that verse 16 still keeps it generic. Don't you know that when you submit yourself to a master, you're slave to do what that master wants you to do? It doesn't even signify we're talking about the Lord here. We're talking about any master. And in verse 16, I really want to spend a little time here because what verse 16 says is whatever master you pick, you must obey. That's the, that's the understanding of ultimate submission and bowing your knee before a master. We must obey because of the love of God. When I come home each day from work, my wife must hug me. She must. Because my looks and my athletic ability and my sense of humor overwhelm her daily. I don't know why you guys are laughing. That was not a joke in my notes. It's overwhelming to her. She must hug me. She must show her affection. And that's what our love for Christ does because he loves us. He first loves us. When you present yourself to someone as master, you obey that master. Before Christ, you had many masters. Here's a point I want you to get from today. There is no such thing as a free person. No one's free. Everyone's enslaved to a master. And the Bible says there's two masters. There's one, the Bible calls it the broad way, which leads to death. That you are a slave to sin, that sin is your master. Any of us that walk with Jesus, before we came to Jesus, that was our master. We had no other options. Now that master masquerades himself as other masters, and we'll get to that in a minute. And then the way that's narrow, the Bible says, few will find it, is the way to life, the way to joy, the way to peace, and that's the master named Jesus. That's really the two options. You ever share Christ with someone, especially if they're younger, and they say, you know what, I got some living to do, and then later I'll get spiritual. Meaning this, that I want to have some fun now, and then I'll submit to Jesus because Jesus, if we're honest, is a killjoy. And then Paul's going to say, what did that, quote, fun master ever bring you except brokenness and, and messed up relationships and fear and, and doubt and worry? Why would you ever want to go back to such a jaded lover, such a jaded master? And Paul is going to want you to know that no one is free. You're either mastered, biblically speaking, by sin or by Jesus. You're going to be a slave to someone. And I think it's powerful because sometimes we think, especially in Austin, oh, I'm a free spirit. There's no such thing. Well, I'm my own master. That's one of the ways that sin will deceive you. You think you're in control. But yet these little idols in your life, like if your idol is approval, then you will do whatever it takes to be approved, even compromise your own character and integrity. If, if your idol is things, then you'll do whatever it takes to amass more things, hoping that more will give you enough. And then when you have these little idols, you can call it whatever you want, but the idol master, the controller, is Satan himself. The Bible's clear. And he'll masquerade it. Most of our idols are good things that we just put in the place of the supreme thing. Most of our idols, there's nothing wrong with wanting your children to do well, but when your idol becomes your children's achievements, then you've got a false God that will leave you empty. Because one day those kids are going to leave, and you're going to realize, you're going to look around, I don't even have a marriage because I made the kids the focus. Does this sound familiar? The kids the focus. And what happens is for 18 years, the tail wags the dogs and the kid runs the home. And then the one you made your covenant vow to, that spouse, has been second, third, fourth place behind whatever the last kid is. You never made a covenant vow to your children. They're not even your kids. They're God's kids. You made a covenant vow to your spouse. And here's why we see so many people get divorced and the last kid goes to college. Because they were roommates living together, a maid and a butler living together. You know the greatest gift, and y'all hear me say this when we do baby dedications, the greatest thing you can give your kids is a great marriage. <laughs> Did you hear that? The greatest thing, not money, not a bigger house, not more sports, the greatest thing you can give your kids is a great marriage. Because the thing that's going to make their life great or horrible is what? Marriage. Your big decisions in life is where I go to college because you got to cheer for that sorry team the rest of your life. 
who you marry is right up there. I'd say it's the best, the top. Past the decision of following Jesus, the next big decision in your life is who you're going to spend the rest of your life with. Because like it or not, that person is going to influence your genealogy. You know, by the way, we're trying to make those decisions when we're 16, 17, 18. You see why we need the grace of God? It's interesting. Paul says slavery is true of all people. Profession of faith without possession of faith is a non-biblical faith. This past week, maybe you remember, we had a freeze here a few months. You remember that? We had a crazy, crazy. And, and my hedges died, or so I thought. And then over time, of course, the landscapers come and they say, what? Dead. Cut them down. We'll order some new ones. Here's your bill, Right? But I said, no, wait, wait. I think there's life. And then this rain started coming, didn't it? What happened to your hedges? There's a little green under there. If there's one green leaf, landscaper, go away. <laughs> go away. I don't want the bill. Well, now I look at this morning, there's several green leaves. You know what? If there's life, it will show and so we have developed, again, this Christianity, especially in America, where when I was 8, I signed a card. When I was 10, I went to camp. When I was 12, I walked down an aisle. I made a decision, and so I'm good. It doesn't matter if there's any spiritual fruit in my life because God and I had this understanding. There is an understanding, but you're the only one who understands it that way because the Bible is clear. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Correct. But if you've called upon the name of the Lord and you're saved, you're a born-again, Jesus-following person, there's going to be a desire for the Word, a desire for His people, corporate worship. There's going to be a desire to serve. And you're going to start walking through this mesh screen daily called the Word of God because you're not satisfied being the way you used to be because you have a new master and you want to be who you're going to be. And you start living in the present what's true about you in the future. Are you with me, church? And so we are born again. I can look around this room, and it's true. There's a, there's a corporate testimony in this room this morning, and I can look at some of you guys and say, I remember what it was like when you didn't walk with Jesus, and your life was a train wreck. And you're different now. I can look at some of the gals. I'm trying to look at anyone individually. I look at some of the gals. You were a stinking mess, right, before Jesus changed your life. You were going through boyfriends like socks, just trying to find something that would make you feel all there. And then all of a sudden, the groom of the universe, amen, said, I love you more than you can imagine, and I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you. Even when I'm faithless, even when you're faithless, because I'm going to live inside of you, and you're going to be a different person, and the things you used to do are going to bother you, and the things that used to not bother you are going to start to convict you, and you're going to change, and I'm going to give you a power that is not natural, supernatural. The Spirit is going to come live inside of you and give you a, a new, the Puritans used to call it unction, a new desire, a new want to. Look at verse 17. But thanks be to God. Let me say that again. That's awesome. Thanks be to God and I? No. To God. That you, see now he changes it. Personal pronouns. You who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. I love that he goes to the personal pronoun you. What Paul is doing is he's preaching, like I, my Baptist preacher just preached, and he's pointing fingers. You were a train wreck, Remember? You would not come to church because you were too embarrassed because you thought your life was that evil. Let me tell you, church is for evil people, right? But we don't stay that way. We change. God changes us from the inside out. Look at verse 18. love this verse. And having been set free from sin, amen, have become slaves of what? It's not that you're not slaves anymore. You just got a new master. Everyone, like the song says, is going to serve someone. Everyone's got a master. There are no free souls in the universe. And such were some of you. We were. Now we have become. And he says, obedient from the heart. You were committed. 
You're, that word committed, here's what it means in the Greek, that you're committed to a body of truth. What this means is that you were taken and you were lifted up and you were taken under an old master and you were placed under a new master. And that little verb there, committed, is in what we call the passive tense in the Greek. It doesn't mean that you said one day, you know, I think the Christian life has some value. I think I'll study it. And I actually think that I'm going to trust in Jesus and call him my Savior. And he and I are going to have a great life together. No, the Bible says you and I were dead in our sins. Dead people can't make decisions. And you were lifted up. You were called. You were brought. You were lifted. You were justified. You were redeemed. You were found out. God wasn't lost. You didn't find God. God found you. You were lost. And he literally committed you under a new master. And then Paul's saying, why would you ever want to go back? What did that ever bring you? What joy did that ever bring you? Often in the Old Testament, when God would want to conform his people more to his image, he would literally put them under another master. And he would, it would literally say in the Old Testament that God gave up the Israelites to the Ammonites. God gave up the Israelites to the Edomites. God gave up the Israelites to the Philistines. You see, Back then, we read those things, we're like, okay, those are, those are real things. Our idols in the New Testament, folks, are just as real. We just haven't called them what they are yet. The idol of achievement, the idol of, 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 of kid worship, the idol of sports, the idol of leisure activity, the idol of entertainment, the idol of alcohol, the idol of shopping, the idol of fitness. And I know you guys, well, he's never had a problem with that. You're right. <laughs> But it is an idol, the idol of what's water to drink every week. And this water makes me live 21 more days than that water. Where you and I differ a little bit is I, I want to go to heaven sooner. <laughs> I want to get there. And it's interesting because Paul says you have been committed. You have been resubmitted to a new master. Look with me at verse 9. Is this making sense, guys? You with me? Look at verse 19. I am speaking in human terms. Paul does this every once in a while. Here's what Paul's going to say, and he's been using this, and I've tried to be real careful with this because of our culture, the, the word slavery. I want you to know that here at Austin Ridge, we stand against any forms of inequality and slavery in this world. We are fighting all over the world trying to fight that. But Paul is using the illustration of slavery, and just like any illustration, when, you're, when your kid says, hey, Trinity, Father, Son, Spirit, all the same, all distinct, explain, Father, and you try to come up with the illustration, well, it's like water and steam and ice. It's all from the same essence, but yet it comes in different forms. I mean, some of you guys are writing that down. That's pretty good. But it falls apart. It falls apart. And that's what Paul is about to tell you. Like, this illustration is given to you in human terms. It falls apart. Why? Because when you say I'm a slave to someone, and our understanding of slavery, and by the way, Paul's writing this when one-third of the Roman Empire were slaves. And matter of fact, in that, in that time, you could actually earn your way out of slavery. So probably 50% of the people who read the book of Romans either were slaves or had been slaves. And Paul wants them to know the illustration falls apart because as a slave in our culture, you never fall in love or feel loved by your master. You just get away from him. And Paul wants you to know this falls apart because in the illustration he's using, you have a new master. And Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest for you will find Rest for your souls. Our master's good, church. He's not a killjoy. He wants to protect you from things that will destroy your life. God doesn't say sex is evil. God created sex. Sex is holy. Amen, church? Only in the confines of marriage because anywhere else, sex outside of marriage destroys people. You're playing house. You're becoming one flesh before the Bible says it's the right thing to do or the, or the right way to do it. And then all of a sudden you wonder why a spouse becomes promiscuous in the relationship. If you're promiscuous before marriage, guess what you'll be after marriage? Promiscuous. I'm amazed when people get remarried to someone who had an affair on their last spouse, but they, they think they're not going to have an affair on me. And what's amazing is this, church, we run to these other lovers thinking, now I'll be happy. And they leave you more empty. Sin leaves you more diminished. So we have a good master. That's why I think Paul's going to say what he says here in verse 19. I'm speaking in human terms because of our natural limitations. For just as you were once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading into more lawlessness, 
So now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. What fruit, what benefit did your last past life bring? Look at verse 20. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. What that means is, before you became a Christian, you didn't care about the Ten Commandments or the law of God. Before you became a Christian, you might have a conscience, you might have been a good non-believing person, but it was just masqueraded because you were on the throne, you were still God, God, you were still in charge, which, by the way, is the biggest form of idolatry and worship itself, right? And, and before you became a Christian, you had one option to do what your body told you to do. Again, look what he says in verse 20, for when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. What that means is if you broke God's law, it didn't bother you. Like, we couldn't wait to get out of that. If you grew up having to go to church, you couldn't wait to get out of church. And you could, like, put the church face on and look churchy, but then Monday looked nothing like Sunday, did it? And Friday night, oh, my gosh, that looked nothing like Sunday because you knew Sunday was coming, and I would just ask for forgiveness again. Look at verse 21. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is what? death we'll close the text verse 22 but now that you've been set free from sin and have become slaves of god the fruit you get leads to sanctification and it's in eternal life for the wages of sin is what death but the free gift of god is eternal life in christ jesus the wage the wage there in the greek it literally means a soldier's pay it's interesting how paul uses the word wage he's a wage is something you've earned so paul says when you live a life of rejecting Jesus as your Lord, meaning you're the master instead of him, which really means Satan's the master instead of him, you're going to reap what you have earned. That, that sin, that master is going to pay you back exactly. It's always going to come on time and it's always going to be accurate. You're going to reap what you've earned. The wage of sin is death, but he doesn't say the wage of God. He says, but the free gift of God. You see, you don't earn that. So you've earned what you receive under the first master. What we receive under the now master, we've never earned. You can't be good enough to go to heaven, and we're never going to resubmit ourselves from this master to this master. We may be miserable under this master. We may be lost under this master. We don't know there's another master that exists. So what we'll do is in this, in, under this master, we'll create religion. We'll create um, other forms of idolatry. We'll even tell ourselves that I have a true spirituality that's between me and God. But you have no understanding of what's happening over here in this camp because that is not an option because over here we're already dead. God has to literally bring you back to life to put you under the right master. Sin pays wages which you deserve. God always gives what you could never earn. Sin, death, Jesus, life. One path makes you think you're in charge. One path shows you you're not in charge, right? One path leads to confidence in religion. Another path leads to brokenness, humility, and godliness. The hardest thing is not to get people saved. We've been saying this through Romans. The hardest thing is for someone to realize they're lost. You ever not come to church on a Sunday? I know none of y'all, but people that are watching. <laughs> and you ride around, and you're like, all these people, they don't go to church? Have, like, literally, like, we have a 9 o'clock service, so you leave here, and, and it's, it's still church time, right? And you're going, first of all, it breaks my heart. <laughs> but second of all, I realize if you were to ask all these people, are you a good person? Absolutely. Are you going to go to heaven when you die? Absolutely. Because there's deception in this camp. And again, coming to church doesn't save you, right? But saved people want to be with God's people. Saved people want to be under the teaching of the word of God. Saved people want to sing about the worthiness of the Lord. Our slavery to sin was broken by the truth of the gospel. That's why Paul says, consider yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Three times in, in Romans 6, Paul uses the word in the Greek, yield. Now, in our culture, yield seems like a weak term. Like, I don't want to yield. I don't want to bow up, right? 
yield. There is power, spiritually speaking, in bowing, in giving. You see, here's the deal. God's undefeated. He's the undefeated one. And he's going to break you. Smart people break quicker. Right? Smart people don't position God to have to do something really strong because we already give. Like we wake up daily saying, I give, you win. <laughs> I yield. And then some of us has to pound a little bit, doesn't he? Now, I love those testimonies of some of you that were thick-skinned and knuckleheads, right? Because we say here there is, we're all what? Lug nuts. And God pounded and he pounded and he pounded. And then one day you wake up and you go, you know, I've never heard the gospel before. No, you heard it hundreds of times. You were just not listening. You saw it every day. You were just not seeing. We saw the presence of God in miracles all the time. We just weren't looking. Why? Because we were dead. I love what yield looks like in the Bible when the angel comes to Mary, a junior high school age girl, and says, oh, you're going to have a child, and she's not even married yet. Now, she could have done one of three things there. She could have first said, nope, not going to do it. And God would have gone and blessed someone else. Or she could have said, hey, God, we'll do it, but we're going to do it my way. You're going to wait till I'm 17, two years after I'm married, and that way no one gets embarrassed and we don't rock the boat with the parents. But I love what she said in Luke 1. Mary said, behold, I'm the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. God, the answer is yes. What's the question? You know how chains come off in your life? You yield. God, I confess to you that I have run to that idol. I have made acceptance. I've made relationships. I've made alcohol. I've made money. I've made business. Fill in the blank, whatever it is. I've made reputation, popularity, my idol, and I want you to break that chain today. I yield. Sometimes it's just self. Self is the, is the idol. So I see two type people that come through my office and the offices of our pastors. Number one. First, it's possible to be a slave to something and think you're free. It's possible to be a slave to something, but you think all the time that you're free. That's the predicament that Paul's talking about for the lost person. They think they're free, but they're actually enslaved to more idols that are so destructive, and they think coming to Jesus will actually kill all the fun. Money, career, sex, alcohol, adventure, kids' accolades, education, achievement, those are the hardest slave masters on this planet. We offer ourselves the sacrifices on some altar, and whatever controls us is our Lord. The person who seeks power is controlled by power. The person who seeks acceptance is controlled by acceptance. We offer ourselves to whatever we seek as our highest good. So if we believe Jesus is the greatest good, we're going to yield to him. But if we think something on this planet is the highest good, we're going to yield to that. And that is the master. So I see people come in. It's possible to be a slave to something and not realize it. Number two, I also think it's possible to be free and think you're enslaved. I think counseling offices are filled with people who have given up the hope that the gospel, they believe the gospel has changed everybody else, but I don't think the gospel can handle my situation. We believe the gospel can, can do miracles, just not in my life. We believe that people can beat addictions, just not mine. And there's a power that you've been freed to that you're not connecting to. So I want to kind of just spend the last few minutes applying this a little bit for us. Because I believe sin robs us of everything. Amen, church? So every time you're tempted, the question is, who are you going to submit to? Do I believe that sin or that action brings the greatest good to my life, and if so, I'll run to it. Or do I believe that's a lie, it's deception, and I'm not going to give in to that temptation, I'm going to run away from it because there's a greater good, his name is Jesus. And you and I face that decision every day, all day. So I, I kind of wrote down a basic battle plan. You ready? I'm going to give you four steps. And the Bible says this, number one, flee temptation. Meaning this, if you struggle with eating things you shouldn't eat, don't work at a chocolate factory. I know that sounds like common sense, doesn't it? 
Like, if you know that you struggle with lust, go home from your girlfriend's house before 10 o'clock. Get out of the situation. Resist temptation. But we don't resist temptation because we really like sin. So we have to not like sin. We have to realize it's going to destroy our lives. And we have to believe that the greatest good is holiness, and then we'll flee it. Sometimes that physically means getting from the location you're in to another location in the moment. Number two, do something that brings honor to God in that moment. I've learned that this is invaluable to me when I'm feeling a temptation and I'm about to do something I should not do and I really don't want to do, but I think I want to do it. I actually turn the tables on Satan <laughs> and say, you know what? I'm not going to do that. I'm going to pray instead. <laughs> and when I'm feeling tempted a lot of times. I'll just start praying. And guess what happens? That temptation subsides because there's an enemy that doesn't want me to pray. Or, or sometimes I'll, in that moment, I'll call a friend to encourage them, and all of a sudden I'm forgetting about what was so attractive a few moments ago. I've got to, it's not just enough for me to resist it. I've got to replace it a lot of times with something else. Does that make sense? Number three, thank God for giving you the option that you didn't have before. Hey, God, thank you that I'm not enslaved to that the way I used to be and that I see through the lie. And number four, this is part of that one, ask God to show you the spiritual warfare going on. Ask him to reveal it to you. Let, I pray this every day, God, make me wise to the things that make me dumb. Make me wise to the things that make me dumb. Like I said before, sin makes you what? Stupid. <laughs> it does. Make me wise to the things that make me dumb. Help me to see it. I love when he pulled back the eyes of the prophet and he saw the angelic realm encased around the field. Lord, help me to see with spiritual eyes. So talking to certain people, going to certain places, listening to certain things, drinking certain things, doing certain things, I'm going to find out real fast how serious I am about holiness. And here's what should scare you more today if you don't have the battle. There's not even a battle. I just do it because I know God's going to forgive me. This text, and Paul would say, I beg to differ. How in the world could we ever betray the groom that has given his life for us to be obedient to him? So I'm going to close with this, because I, 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 believe, I believe when Jesus says in John 8, 36, that the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed, is true. I believe in a room this size with this many people, there are a lot of chains that need to come off today. It may be a porn addiction, it may be an alcohol addiction, it may be a drug addiction, it may be an addiction to relationships, it may be an addiction to sex, it may be an addiction to fill in the blank. I don't know what your chain is, but I do know there's a chain breaker. I do know that there's freedom in Christ. I do believe there's nothing that the power of God can't break. Amen? Do you believe that? I believe that. I've seen it in my life. So what chains do you want broken today? Because there is something so much worse that a, than what a human can do to you, and that's what the spiritual world can do to you. It can wreck you and leave you in a heaval of mess, and you don't even realize you got attacked. And the thing is, the spiritual world never comes and says, hey, I'm about to tempt you. If you do what I'm about to tempt you to do, here's what's going to happen. It's not going to go well, but good luck. It just wipes you out. What chains need to come off today, church? What's keeping you back? If, if God were to come down today and say, there's something in your life I need to deal with, you know what that is. What would he put his finger on? That's the chain I'm talking about right now. Would you pray with me? And I want to I hear and see and sense us seeing the power of God break some chains right now. Father, as we come to you today, I just thank you for my friends in this room. I thank you for my friends listening, Dripping Springs, Southwest Campuses. We come to you today as a, as a body of Christ, that you're the head and we're the body and we want to go the way the head goes. And so, Father, there's some chains that we need broken in our lives today. Father, there's some addictions that maybe have plagued us for decades that maybe we've just given up on thinking it's just the way it is for me. Lord, I pray that right now your Holy Spirit would overwhelm 
those chains. You are the undefeated one. There's no mountain that you can't move. There's no miracle that you can't bring. There's no life that you can't change. How do I know? Because you changed mine. Lord, I pray that the only thing we would seek peace and joy and love in is you. Everything else is going to leave us empty, diminished. Lord, would you do a work in our hearts? We pray for freedom today. We don't want to be the people we used to be. We want to be the people that we are and the people that we're going to be. So today, Father, we just lay the shackles below your feet and say, God, we need some help. Would your power do that today, Lord? It's in your name, the name above every name we pray, the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's stand up together and respond and worship. One name. One name holds weight above them all. His fame outlasts the earth before. His prayer.
No, church, we're not done yet today. We got one more thing to sing. I just wanted to remind you that as we leave this place to do when, today, when we do, you go in the power of God. You go in the presence of God. The God above all is with you. He is for you. Let's not forget that as we leave. Let's sing it out. Say the earth will shake and chains will break. Come on. The earth. Amen. What an awesome song. Man, it is so good to be with you today, Shep. Thank you and team for leading us to the Lord today. We're grateful. Just one more quick thing before we head out today. Ladies, we've got something for you that we're excited about. We've got a summer study that's coming up, a five-week live in-person study that's built to give you the blueprints to understand discipleship, to be in intentional relationships with one another and with the Lord. Discipleship is not a to-do list. It's not just simply a program that we put on here. It's not a department. It is an opportunity to tell stories, to listen to stories, to integrate your story with others and ultimately with Jesus to understand the redemptive story that he has for each of us. And so, ladies, we want to encourage you to join up for this. You see the information on the screen. No previous Bible study background is necessary to come, so come, enjoy one another, meeting one another, and getting connected with the Lord. It was good to be with you today, as always, and we just want to let you know that the Connections Desk, if you want to take some next steps in your faith and or here at the church, but perhaps right now, most importantly, if you need prayer, we want to be here for you. There'll be a couple of us down here by the stage that would love to just pray with you. Uh, we also have some pastors that are in the lounges, both upstairs and downstairs, seek them out. It's okay. We're all broken. We need some help sometimes. So come. We would love to be able to participate with you in that. It was good to be with you. If you were with us online today, thank you for joining us. For all of you here, you're dismissed. It was good to be with you today.